this morning. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to take your Bible and leave them open to our passage today. We are in Matthew chapter 15 is where we're going to be studying from. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get into our text today. Lord, we thank you today for giving us the privilege and opportunity to meet here where we can worship you and serve you once again. Lord, we just want to pause and say thank you that we have a place to come together to worship you. Many have been devastated by the recent events, and so I pray that we would not take that lightly. But today, God, I ask that as we do gather, that this would not just be another time for us to go through the motions. Lord, I do pray that we would use this time to reflect upon your word, that we would be taught, that I would be faithful to the teaching and preaching of your word. And Lord, forgive me of the sin that is in my life. I ask that you place it beneath the blood of Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 15. Boy, this is a, there's a lot in this chapter. I'm going to tell you that. In fact, tonight, um, the lesson that I'm doing in Zechariah, uh, it talks about the exact same thing, basically, just from a different perspective. But here's a question I want to begin with this morning, and just jot this question down on your outline there, if you don't mind, because it's a thought-provoking question. It's something I really want you to intently give some thought to before you leave today. And this is the question. How is your heart? And I'm speaking spiritually. I'm not talking about physically, but we're talking about spiritually. If you was given a spiritual uh, EKG today, what would the results come back and what would it say about your heart spiritually? Well, that's a question I think we all need to ask ourselves from time to time. And it's a question that Jesus is asking in this passage. In fact, what you will find is there is a recurring theme in the book of Matthew. And that recurring theme comes down to this topic. There is a difference between being spiritual and being religious. Those two things are two very different things. A person may claim to be religious, but that does not make them spiritual. And so in our text today, Jesus addresses that very topic again. And in essence, here's what he's saying. For all of those that are listening to him, he's looking at them and he is saying, I want you to know that being religious simply is not enough. That's not going to do it. There's more to the Christian life than that. In fact, if you want to be right with God, if you want to move beyond those limits that have been placed in your life, those limits of external uh, religious behavior, Jesus is teaching a principle here, and he's teaching a message here that it comes down to the heart. And your heart is what really matters when it comes to your relationship with Christ. It is a spiritual matter. Do you realize your heart is a spiritual matter? Spiritually speaking, the things that are in your heart, the things you do, the things that you say, but how those also come out, those are a not just religious matter, but a spiritual matter. Now, we're not talking about the little things people would talk about in their, in their Christian life, all the do's and the don'ts. Jesus is taking it much deeper than that. And in fact, in Matthew chapter 15, the text today, Brother Black read the entire chapter to us there, but it records a story that is very important for us to understand. Now, we make the mistake sometime of reading these stories about Jesus and in his ministry, during his ministry, and we really don't try to apply them much to our life because they're about Pharisees and they're about encounters that he had. But in this specific story, it records some religious leaders that come to Jesus and his disciples, and they are concerned with ritualistic law. In other words, they were very religious people. Don't make a mistake and think that they were not. But they were asking him about a question of something being unclean. And because of that, what took place in the story, they would actually take it the next step and they would say that this is sinful. Now again, Jesus is not talking in this passage about don't steal, don't lie, uh, don't murder. No, he's talking about rules such as do not help your neighbor on the Sabbath. Or what we'll find in this passage specifically, what happens if you do not wash your hands before you eat? So that's kind of the background of what we're getting ready to get into. So let's look at it more in depth and 
more closely and see what Jesus was teaching, what principles that we could carry out in our walk with Christ as well. Well, we have to go back to verse 1, and I want to walk us through this text. In verse 1, I want you to notice something here. It says, Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem, and they asked this question, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They do not wash their hands before they eat. Now, there's a phrase in verse 1 that I want you to circle, and it's the phrase tradition of the elders. And then I want you to underline this part of the text, they don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, why is that such a big deal? Well, you have to understand the context not only of this passage, but of that culture as well. And we have to understand that the Pharisees believe strongly. If you did not wash your hands, that was a sin. And most of you are probably sitting here today saying, I think my mother was a Pharisee because she told me that often. And she treated me as though if I didn't wash my hands, it was a sin. But the Pharisees didn't just say it, they actually believed it. Now, this law that they had in place during that time was not about hygiene at all. It was more about religious behavior. Remember I said there's a difference between being religious and spiritual. And the law that they are referring to had to do with their religious ritual and their religious behavior. Now where did this teaching come from? This is where we have to begin building this text to understand where it comes from. Did it come specifically from the Old Testament about not washing your hands before you eat? No. Some would say, well, yes, it did. No, it did not. Verse 1 tells us exactly where this came from, and it says it came from the tradition of the elders. But I want you to understand why that is so very important. Because the tradition of the elders would be the teaching of the Jewish leaders of that time. Who, by the way, they had certain laws back then, certain, uh, I guess you, you could call it rituals, or maybe you could even call them customs, in a way that they would interpret God's word and how then they would apply God's law to everyday life. So the Pharisees, to the Pharisees, the tradition of the elders were superior to scripture. If the, the elders said one specific thing about scripture, that was superior to anything else. It, it's much of what happens in the Catholic church today. Whatever the Pope says would be superior or equal to scripture it was treated the same way there and so you say well that's a crazy way of thinking well do you realize we still have some of that today we still have churches that consider their uh, denominational dogma to be the standard apart from scripture they'll put all these rules and regulations upon people and they'll say well we think this is really what the scripture meant when it said this here's one thing that i've always found to be true about scripture God never needed any of us to interpret what he said. He meant exactly what he said, and he said it the way that he wanted it to be said. So these Pharisees are calling Jesus on the carpet, so to speak. Why? Because his disciples did not wash their hands before they ate. And then Jesus responds to them in this text, and I want you to see this in an amazing way. And he says, in effect, if you think following God is about washing your hands, you have missed it altogether. Now, he has just painted a picture of what many teach about Christianity today. If you think doing all these good things and following all these customs of the church is what is going to get you into heaven, then you must be sadly mistaken. I don't know exactly what heaven's going to be like, but I'm pretty sure it's not going to be what any of us think it's going to be like, especially Baptists. You know, we all think heaven's going to be just like our church, the way that we worship. What we might find is heaven's going to be a lot different. Some of us may be shocked when we get there to find out things that will take place in heaven. But here's the question. Jesus, your disciples did not wash their hands. And of course, you equate that back What would the Pharisees be saying about them? That means they have sinned. Then in the next few verses, 
Jesus points out a couple things that would help us. That is, everyone that really truly wants to live a life pleasing to God, he gives us some practical things as he really chastises these Pharisees that will help us. And we want to look at them very closely this morning. The response that Jesus gives to the Pharisees. I want to tell you something, church. You do not want to be labeled as a Pharisee. Not only labeled as a Pharisee, you don't want to be a Pharisee. It's not a good thing to be a Pharisee. And while we don't call people Pharisees today, this whole sin of Phariseeism is a sin that can threaten every one of us. Those of us sitting here today, we are threatened by this sin of Phariseeism. Well, how do we prevent that? Well, this text tells us because Jesus broke it down perfectly, as you would expect. I want to look at three things primarily that will help us to avoid that. Avoid that sin of Phariseeism. You know, I ask you the question to begin with, how's your heart spiritually? Maybe a better question I could have asked you today is this, are you a Pharisee? If you really think about the way you live your Christian life, are you a Pharisee? Well, the way that you answer that question is to look at your heart. So look, let's look at these things that Jesus taught us. Number one, and I want you to write this down. Number one, there is no loophole when it comes to obedience in your life as a Christian. No loopholes at all. Why do we see Christians trying to find all the things, the loopholes in Christianity so they can do just enough to get by? Just enough to get into heaven. Listen, if that's your idea of getting into heaven, you've missed it. And Jesus, when he said here it's an issue of the heart, it truly is an issue of the heart if that's your idea of Christianity. How much sin can I get away with and still get into heaven? See, that's very religious, but it's also very sinful. And so when the Pharisees here, I want you to notice, asked Jesus why his disciples did not ceremonially wash their hands before eating, they didn't follow that ceremonial tradition there, I want you to notice what Jesus says. And pick up with me here in verse number 3 through verse 5. Jesus then, in turn, turns it around on them. And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition. That's an important phrase. For the sake of your tradition. Verse 4, For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father and mother must be put to death. Verse 5, But you say that if a man shall say to his father and mother, Whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is a gift devoted to God. Now that's a phrase there that I want you to circle also. A gift devoted to to God, because we're going to come back to that. There's a, there's a parallel here, and there's something that we need to see here. But go to verse 6. He is not to honor his father with it. Thus, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. Now, when I read those verses there, we're talking about Jesus being presented with this whole idea of, why did you all not wash your hands? And Jesus responds with this response about obeying your mother and your father. Does that not seem like an odd response? Well, it seems like an odd response if we don't understand what he's talking about. Because Jesus immediately went right back to the Pharisees and he was referring to a loophole that the Pharisees had found with the teaching of the elders. Remember that phrase, the teaching of the elders? When the elders would look at scripture and they would say, this is what it means. And they would interpret it, it for themselves. And they maybe add a little to it or, or put a loophole in it so they didn't have to perhaps live by it. Here, let, let me just get to the bottom of it so you can really understand this. We'll do this quickly. In those days, they had no retirement plan. They had no such thing as uh, social security. So it was considered a son's responsibility to take care of his aging parents. That means take care, not only allow them to live with them, but all their financial obligations as well. So there was this certain tradition that said a son is bound to support his father, even if that son loses everything and he has to go out and beg so that his parents have what they need to live. Now, these very religious people would look at that and they would say, thanks, Mom and Dad, for bringing me into the world, but I'm not going to lose everything that I have and have to beg on the street to take care of you when you get old. 
But God said, if you remember one of the commandments, honor your fathers and your mothers. And so the teachers of the law developed a tradition that superseded their responsibility to take care of their parents. Now, can you imagine anyone taking scripture and saying, I really don't like what that says, so let me tell you what that really says, and this is not what it says, so follow what I say, not what God said. Doesn't that seem to be a bit problematic? Well, it should, because what the tradition of the elders came up with superseded the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, which is found in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12. Now, here's the loophole. You have to stay with me. This is a long explanation, but if you do not get this, this passage makes no sense at all. So here's the explanation. Here's the, the loophole. Over the years, a tradition developed that allowed a person to call their possessions. So a man, the possessions that he had, he could say these specific things are sacrificed to God. It's the Greek word korban. And that word korban meant these specific things are sacrificed to God. So if he had money or he had possessions and he wanted to hang on to them to make sure of all things, you wouldn't want your parents taking your money, right? Then he would say these are dedicated to God. And I'm pledging them to God and upon my death these things are to be given to the temple. Now, do you see how this is working here so far? Here's the catch. The tradition of the elders said, well, if you make something korban, if you make something dedicated to God, you are still allowed to use it while you're alive, but your parents can't get to it. None of your family members can get to it. So do you see how they created a way to protect their stuff against what God said so that they did not have to follow through with the things that God said? So in other words, your parents are sick and they're destitute and they need a place to live. And you say, hey, I would love to have you come in and live with me, but my house is korban. My house is dedicated to God. My house is given to the temple when I die. And because that has now made that holy, guess what? You're not allowed to live here. Well, doesn't that just kind of go against everything that God said? Do you see the loophole that they created there? By the way, we have many people in religion today that are creating all kinds of loopholes for Christians to still do all kinds of things that are sinful and not feel bad about it. It's kind of like this. Let me give you a quick illustration. Let's say you have 10 pairs of shoes in your closet. And you say, I am going to declare those shoes korban. My shoes are now dedicated to God. When I die, I'm giving my shoes to the church. Don't do that, by the way. So then your family comes along and your family has no shoes. They have nothing to wear. You're allowed to use them during your lifetime. You can wear them out. Temple gets them when you're gone. But if your family comes, you have to say, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Do you see how that benefits the person? But it neglects all of the people that were in need. All you would have to say is, well, wait, these don't belong to me. I'm not being mean. I'm not being unkind. I mean, I've given everything that I have to God. And as a result of that, I can use it. God said, I can use it. But you can't use it. So this tradition was developed to supersede the fifth commandment. Because in that culture, and God had set it up this way, that we are required to care for our parents until their dying day. Now, that took a lot for people, and they didn't like that. So the tradition of the elders was, we're not going to go with that. We know that God says that, but we're not going to follow that. So let's have a loophole here, and we'll call it korban. We'll call it dedicated to God, sacrifice to God. It's going to the temple so we can use it till we die, and then after that, we don't have to worry about it. That's a loophole. Do you see how loopholes can come into the Christian life if we're not careful. For example, this person, they did me wrong. And as a result, I don't have to do right to them. Oh, is that really what the Lord said? Or is that just a loophole? The point is there are no loopholes that absolve you from obedience, from doing exactly what God has told you that you should do. 
This is nothing more than modern day Phariseeism. Now there's a second thing here that Jesus mentions, teaches in this passage. The second thing would be this, jot this down, and that is that there is no substitute for love in the Christian life. He deals with this as Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, and that goes back to verse 7 through verse 9. Now follow along here. Jesus looks at them after they've said this, and he says, you're a bunch of hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. Verse 8, I'm paraphrasing. These people, talking about those there that day, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And then in verse 9, you worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. The, the words their rules taught by men parallels back to the tradition of the elders. They're connected. He's building a case here. He's building a story. What we have to understand as a follower of Christ is this. He holds us to a high standard. We cannot live our life just any way that we want to live our life and think that that's okay with God. You know why I truly believe many Christians don't read the Bible? Because every time they do, they find that there's a standard of holiness there. There's conviction that is there in the way that they're living their life. And so Jesus says, listen, folks, it's not enough just to go through the motions. You, you can't just say the right words. You have to live them. You can't just give all of this religious talk. It has to be part of your heart. It has to be heartfelt. Do you realize that when you truly love God, the problem of obedience will always take care of itself? Do you agree with that? When you truly love God from your heart, with everything within you, the problem of obedience, it just it takes care of itself. Because you're living your life in a way that you love God and you want to please God more than you want to please man. Now some would say, well then what's, what about all these traditions that we have as Christians, all these different traditional ceremonies that we have? Well, they've been part of Christianity for centuries. They're not all bad, but they're not substitutes for heartfelt devotion. Can I give you an example? Every wedding I've ever performed, I stand with a bride and a groom, and they repeat something called vows. I promise to do this, and I promise to do that. They have usually a unity candle of some sort that's uh, identifying they're coming together as one. They exchange rings as a promise that they're making to each other, and that's all tradition, and I think there's nothing better than a traditional wedding. In fact, many weddings today make me sick if you just really watch the stuff that's going on in them. They're not really weddings at all. But if that bride and groom does not have heartfelt devotion towards one another, they can say all the vows they want. They can buy the most expensive ring. But it's not going to change the heart. The heart is what's really important. In fact, over in Matthew 22 and verse 37, you have to remember that Jesus said the greatest commandment <clears throat> is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Your heart has to be in it. If you want to avoid becoming a modern day Pharisee, I would challenge you to ask yourself this question, how is my heart? Let loving God be the number one goal in your life. Every day when you wake up, that should be part of your prayer. God, I truly want to love you with all of my heart. Why? Because if God has your heart, then you're on the way of him creating you into his son's image. There is no substitute for the love that you have for God. No loopholes, no substitute. You can't create your own religion. You can't pretend. By just saying that you love God, it has to be a lifestyle. Now, there's a third and final thing this morning that Jesus teaches us here. Number three, there is no replacement for true purity. Purity is an interesting word, is it not? Well, in verse 10 through verse 20, and I'm going to paraphrase here, but notice what Jesus says in verse 10. It's a resounding command. He says, listen to me and understand what I'm saying. Verse 11, what goes in a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth, that's what makes him unclean. Now that's a strong message, isn't it? 
Go down to verse 17. Jesus goes on. Don't you see that whatever enters a man's mouth goes into the stomach and then comes out of the body? Verse 18. But things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. These make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. And he concludes it in verse 20 by saying this. These are what make a man unclean. But eating with unwashed hands, that does not make a man unclean. Hey, it's good hygiene, by the way, right? But it doesn't make a man unclean. What is Jesus saying here? He's talking about the externals. And he's saying very plainly, the externals are not what matters. I mean, you can have an individual that comes in here today and they've got tattoos from their head all the way to their toes. They could have earrings, all, you know, you know the big things people put in their ears and all of, all of that. They could have all of that. And many of you would look at them and you would probably judge them and you would say, boy, I hope that they hear the word today and I hope that they get saved today. You don't know what's in their heart. You have no idea what's in their heart. Those external things, by the way, may help you get a job or prevent you from getting a job, but it really has nothing to do with the heart. And when we look at that, we become the problem. We see external signs as signs of righteousness. You know why I wear a suit when I preach? I say this all the time. This gets me in so much trouble. I do not wear a suit because I have to wear a suit. I wear a suit because I want to wear a suit and I feel comfortable wearing a suit and it's a respect for the office of pastor. If a person doesn't wear a suit, you realize that's all external? Jesus never wore a suit, by the way, when he taught in the temple. I'll just, I'm just going to, this is another sermon for another day. I'm not even going to start that uh, topic today. But we're talking about externals. And externals, Jesus says, is not what matters. What matters is the heart. It's not enough to look the part. It's not enough to go through the motions of our religious behavior. Most of us know how to act like good Christians. It's not enough to follow the right customs. These things don't replace the necessity of a pure heart. So I conclude with the question that I began with today. How is your heart? The second question, are you a Pharisee? The way that you answer that first question will give you the answer to the second question. And here's what I know about living the Christian life. Every day, it's a journey. Every day, it's learning. Every day, it's trying to become more and more like Christ. Let's make a commitment today. Say, Lord, I want my heart to be pure. I want my heart to be holy. I want my heart to be dedicated to you. And today, God, as a Christian, I'm not going to look for loopholes. I'm going to give my entire heart to you, and I'm going to live for you in a way that I've never lived before. I can tell you, based upon the authority of God's word, if you make that commitment to Christ, your life will never be the same. He will change you inside and out. I believe that.